Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Guys of Magic. This is Hunter and David. Say what up, David. Yo, what's going on, everybody? We are back. That's right. We are doing the bigger, the badder, the $300 upgrade to the pre-con from Duskborn called Death Toll. That is right. We've gone over the $100 upgrade. If you haven't already seen that, check the description below for that video. This is a direct sequel to that video. So check it out first. Come back. Check this one out. But David, let's go ahead and remind the people that we are talking about winter today. If you guys wanted to see Rendma, that upgrade is exclusive on our Patreon. Check the description as well for the Patreon link. But like I said, Dave, this is winter. Talk to me. Remind the people of what winter does and kind of what the direction of the deck is going. Yeah, so our commander is uh, four mana. It's two, a black, and a green. For a legendary creature human, Warlock is a 2-5 with death touch and says whenever it attacks, you mill three cards. It also has Delirium, so it says that at the beginning of our end step, we may exile any number of cards from our graveyard with four or more uh, card types among them. If you do, put a permanent card from among them onto the battlefield with a finality counter on it. So this is good old-fashioned uh, Delirium. It's just Golgari Reanimator. We're going to be playing around with a lot of like Golgari uh, good stuff, tr trying to cheat our cards into play. Golgari good stuff, cheating things into play. Who would have thunk? But yeah, I'm excited to see what you've done with this. But before we get into the additions, David, let's hear a word from our sponsor. Hey, what's up, nerds? Today's video is sponsored by our good friends over at Evoke the Art, bespoke token series. If you're looking for another way to upgrade your decks, Evoke the Art's got you covered. Their complete set comes with 50 tokens, 45 of which are double-sided, offering a diverse range of artwork and utility. Head on over to zaximusstudios.etsy.com to pick up yours today. You can find the link in the description. Once again, huge thanks to Evoke the Art. Now let's get back to the video. All right. Nice, Shane. Thanks for that word. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and get into these additions. Let's not keep the people waiting. This deck is a continuation of the 100. So right now you're seeing all of the cards we put in for the $100 upgrade. Uh, basically, the way that this is going to work is all of these cards are going to be included in the $300 upgrade. We're just building off of this. All right. Perfect. Sequel. Video. Description. Previous. Check it out. <laughs> uh, but this is the $300 edition. Let's talk about these big new cards, starting with the creatures. Yeah, and uh, talking about big new cards, I really wanted to put this in the $100 version for a pretty obvious reasons here in a moment. I was not able to, but I feel like, you know what, you can't play a Delirium deck without just kind of like the biggest, meanest, most nasty Delirium creature out there. And that is Embercruel, The Promised End. This is 13 mana for a legendary creature, Eldrazi. It is a 13-13, and it costs one less to cast for each card type among cards in your graveyard. So the longer the game goes on, or if we are able to kick off her graveyard shenanigans, Emrakul can get relatively cheaper. Um, she also says that whenever you cast her, you gain control of target opponent during that player's next turn. After that turn, that player takes an extra turn. It's fine. It's a weird sequencing. It's not going to matter. Chances are you're going to use like all their resources and blow up their board in the process. So they're just basically spending that turn rebuilding. And then after all of that, Emrakul is a creature with flying trample and protection from instance. So it is a gigantic beater. It's very difficult to deal with. And you get to use all of your opponent's cards to take out another opponent and just like exhaust them in the process. Yeah, Dave, Emrakul is a really mean card to add here. Uh, seven mana, if I'm not mistaken, is going to be the cheapest. This will come down pretty quick, more than 13. Or should I say a lot sooner than 13? It's just... Uh, ah, I'm terrified. Yeah, it's a pretty good card. It is a lot of fun. It doesn't close out the game, but I mean, it, it's going to ruin somebody's day. And then it's probably going to put a giant target on your back. But that's what we're here for, right? That's what we're here for. It's the death toll. Uh, moving on, I do have a couple of other creatures. These next ones obviously not going to be anywhere near as big. I don't know how much, like, I don't I don't know how I could, like, really do that anyways. Uh, but the next card here is going to be Burrow Goyf. This is two and a black for a creature, Lure Goyf. It is a star slash star plus one um, as far as his power and toughness goes. And I'll get into that in here in just a moment. But this creature does have both Death Touch and Lifelink, so your opponents probably don't want to block this. It says that its power is equal to the number of card types among cards in all graveyards. Um, and its toughness is equal to that plus one. So it works really well with our Delirium as well. And then it also says whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you may mill that many cards. And if you do, you put a creature card from among them into your hand. So this is just going to make sure that we are not only getting additional card advantage with whatever card we choose to put into our hand, but we're also milling more cards as well. This card works fantastic with this list. 
It really does. It grows itself as well. So if it wasn't as maximum impact as it could be, Willing those cards itself turns on Delirium for your other cards as well as pops this up. I like it. Yeah, and then the uh, the next creature I want to talk about, this one very much so on the opposite end of the spectrum is what we've been talking about. This one is very small. This is Delighted Halfling. It's a single green mana. It's a creature. Halfling is a 1-2. You can tap it for a colorless, so you can tap it and add one mana of any color to your mana pool. You can only spend that on legendary creatures, though, or legendary spells, I'm sorry. Uh, but that spell can't be countered, so this is a way for us to be able to ramp up into our commander a little bit earlier, also while giving it some counter protection. Yeah, and uh, I couldn't help but notice Emrakul is also a legendary creature that will probably be uncounterable if you have Delighted Halfling on the field. Oh boy. I mean, let's be real. The cast trigger on that card alone is enough to ruin somebody's day. That's true. Okay, I see three more creatures. Three more creatures. These do have a theme, though. So whenever we return things from the graveyard to the battlefield in this list, sadly, they're going to come back with a finality counter on them. And that is one of our least favorite kind of counters in the entire game. So these next three creatures are going to help us out with that. The first of which is Fane the Broker. This is two and a black for a total of three mana. You get a legendary creature, Human Warlock. It's a 3-3, three, three, and it's got three abilities. The first of which is that you can tap it to sacrifice a creature, put two plus one plus one counters on target creature. That's actually kind of relevant in this list because this allows you to maintain that delirium if you do end up pulling out enough creatures. Next up, we can tap it, remove a counter from a creature you control to create a treasure token. That's really the reason why Fane's in here. Might as well get rid of the finality and also ramp yourself at the same time. That's amazing. To continue, though, because there's more, you can tap them, sacrifice an artifact. You can create a 2-1 white and black inkling creature token with flying, or you could pay three and a black to untap him. So kind of a Swiss army knife of a creature here, but does a lot of work in this list. Yeah, that middle part of remove a counter to make a treasure is getting rid of downside for upside. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, very, very good. Um, not quite as impactful, but definitely kind of along the same line. We have Ferropede next. This is three mana for an artifact creature insect. It is a 1-1 one, one that is unblockable, and it says whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you may remove a counter from target permanent. So same thing, you're going to be choosing whatever thing that has a finality counter for you, and just get rid of it. Get it gone. This card is Hexavus. It is six mana for an artifact creature construct. It is a 0-0 zero, zero with flying. and says when it enters the battlefield with six plus one plus one counters on it. You could pay one mana and remove a plus one plus one counter from Hexavus to put a flying counter on another target creature. So pump up your team a little bit, give them a little bit more evasion. Or the reason why this card is really powerful, you could pay one mana to remove a counter from another creature you control, put a plus one plus one counter on Hexavus. So get rid of one of those finality counters from one of your other creatures and you're going to be pumping up this thing, which is already a pretty, big, a pretty sizable creature in the air. Yeah, I like all three of these cards. Just get rid of those finality counters. Who needs them? Moving on, I see one instant and one sorcery. Yeah, so not a whole lot here as far as non-permanents go. Ultimately, I feel like that kind of makes sense given the nature of our commander. We still need them in the deck to make sure that we hit Delirium, but we're not recurring these. The first card is going to be Life from the Loma. This is one in a green for a sorcery. It says return up to three target land cards from your graveyard to your hand, and it has Dredge 3. Having Dredge on this card is so, so powerful. Uh, this allows us to make sure that we're just kind of continuously feeding our graveyard while also making sure that we're not going to be missing out on any of our land drops. Yeah, Dredge, very good in this deck. And then the next card here, that instant that we were alluding to, this is Assassin's Trophy. For a black and a green, you get an instant that says destroy target permanent and opponent controls. Uh, its controller may search their library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield, and then shuffle. Good removal is good. Yep, good removal is good. And moving on to more of the permanent types, one artifact, one enchantment. The artifact that we're going to be throwing into this list, I'm not going to lie, this is a $300 budget, so we are going to be goofing around with some cards that are a little bit more on the higher power, and we do have some relatively large uh, power creatures as well as just mana value creatures, so I needed some mana ramp in here, and the Great Hinge is going to help to provide that. This is seven and two green for an artifact that is never going to actually cost you nine mana. It says it costs X less to cast, where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. You can tap it to add two green, and if you do, you also gain two life. And it says whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it and draw a card. 
So a lot of work that the Great Hinge is going to be putting out there for us. Also, this works wonderfully because it doesn't care about casting. So if we reanimate one of our creatures, it'll come back with that plus one, plus one counter and draw us a card too. Yeah, the Great Henge has been one of my favorite legendary artifacts ever since they printed it in the original Eldraine. And let me tell you, I wish they keep reprinting this into Oblivion so I could put it into all my green decks. <laughs> they most certainly need to. Mm -hmm. Last up, I do have a single enchantment here. This is going to be Ripples of Undeath. It is one in a black for two mana. You get an enchantment that says at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, mill three cards. Then you may pay one mana and three life. If you do, you put a card from among those cards into your hand. Uh, this is mainly there just to be able to fill our graveyard with stuff. But if we do have a card that we don't want to go to the graveyard, this allows us to be able to pay a life and mana to be able to put it into our hand anyways. Yeah, self-milling, once again, really effective in this deck, and Ripples of Undeath, really good include. And finally, David, I do see we've touched the mana base once again. Yes, uh, we most certainly have. The first card they're going to be putting in here is Beseju, who endures. It's a legendary land that you can tap for a green mana, or you can channel it away by paying one of the green and discarding it. If you do, you destroy target artifact, enchantment, or non-basic land that opponent controls. That player may search their library for a land card with a basic land type, put it onto the battlefield, and then shuffle. And then, of course, this ability costs one less to activate for each legendary creature you control. Whew, that is a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> um, ultimately, Beseju is incredibly powerful. We can use this as a land if we absolutely need to. But more powerful than that, we can use this to take care of one of our opponent's pesky permanents. And by channeling this, we're also fueling our graveyard. So this is doing double duty in this list. Yeah, it is a really good card here. And let me tell you, you can't get countered either in the channel. No, you cannot. It is not a spell. Um, very similar to Pesaju. In fact, actually part of the same cycle is Takanuma Abandoned Mire. Once again, a legendary land. This one taps for a black, and this one also has channel. The channel for this one is three and a black, and it says discard this card as well as mill three cards and return a creature or planeswalker card from your graveyard to your hand. This ability costs one less to activate for each legendary creature you control. Um, this one, obviously not quite as good as Pesaju, but still kind of functions along the same lines. It allows us to get some extra value out of what have would have otherwise been just a land while also helping us to fuel our graveyard. Yeah, hey, if something makes it to the graveyard, you could just be like, oh, I really wanted that back. I don't have the way to get it out right now. Go and get it. Next up, as far as lands go, we're going to put in Dakmore Salvage. This is a land that always enters the battlefield tapped, and I do hate that, but it taps for black, and this is a land that has dredge too. So a little bit of, uh, of self-mill in the case that we end up putting this into our graveyard. Maybe we mill this over. We can make sure that we kind of keep that chain going. Keep the chain going. I like it. Undergrowth Stadium is going to be the next land here. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you have two or more opponents. So thank you so much for playing a game of Commander with me. Uh, and then it taps for a black or a green. And then lastly in this list, I don't know how in the world I managed to miss this, but thank you so much uh, to our viewers for commenting down below. Sometimes, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what happens, but this one definitely got past me on the 100. This is Nesting Grounds. Uh, should have been included in the 100 as well. But this is a land that you can tap for a colorless, or you can pay one mana, tap it, and move a counter from target permanent you control to another target permanent. You activate only as a sorcery. This allows you to be able to move those finality counters, and you don't actually have to put it on your permanent. You can put it on your opponent's permanents instead. So put a finality counter on that big, scary creature. That way it never comes back. Yeah, if that thing dies, it's exiled forever. All right, Dave, is that going to do it for all the additions for this 300 upgrade? That is going to do it for the additions. Uh, I tried not to put a ton of additions because we all have already pretty heavily touched this deck when it comes to the $100 upgrade. Okay, well, let's get on to the cuts. Once again, though, David, you are keeping all the cuts the same. Is that correct? That is the same. So anything that was removed from the 100 is still removed from this list. Sadly, none of those kind of changed my mind or my opinion. Um, if it's gone, it's gone. Mm. Sad to see these all go. But if you wanted to see the reasonings behind why david removed these check the link in the description as well for that video but let's talk about these new removals i see two planeswalkers right off the rip yeah i'm not gonna lie this this precon does come with four planeswalkers and like it's cool i understand why some of these some of these planeswalkers do have the ability to um to mill which is like it's neat they can kind of sort of fuel the graveyard and in and of themselves they're in here because they count as one of those permanent types. I'm sorry, one of those card types. I just felt like 
they weren't really high impact enough. So the first card here is Grist the Hunger Tide. It's three mana for a legendary planeswalker, it enters with three loyalty. It says it's a 1 1 insect creature in addition to its other types if it's not on the battlefield, which can sometimes be relevant. Um, it does have three abilities, the first of which is a plus one, in which you create a 1 1 black, uh, black and green insect creature token, and then you mill a card. If an insect card was milled this way, you put a loyalty counter on Grist, and then you repeat this process. Ultimately, there's just there's not enough insects in this list to make that actually something that you count on. It does have a minus two, in which you can sacrifice a creature whenever you do use destroy target creature or planeswalker, so I do like the removal there. And then lastly, it's got a minus five. Each opponent loses life equal to the number of creature cards in your graveyard. Funny enough, with this being a graveyard deck, we're reanimating and exiling out our graveyard constantly. So we don't actually ever hit a point where, like, that's probably going to kill an opponent. We might minus five and hit somebody for, like, three. Yeah, that's, uh, that card doesn't seem as good as some of the other cards you added into this deck. So I can see why you're removing this one. The next Planeswalker that, that I'm going to be uh, removing from this list, I actually do like a lot more, just not in this shell. This is Professor Onyx. She is four and two black for a legendary planeswalker, Liliana. It enters with five loyalty and has Magecraft. So it states that whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, each opponent loses two life and you gain two life. That is a wonderful way to just be able to close out games. If you're playing in a spell slinger deck, this is not. So that's not doing a whole lot for us. Her plus one says that you lose one life. Look at the top three cards of your library. You put one of them into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. So it's like you kind of mill two and then you're able to draw a card. Uh, she has got a minus three. Each opponent sacrifices a creature with the greatest power among creatures they control. So that's, once again, that's awesome. It's removal, but it's not necessarily targeted. And then lastly, she does have an ultimate that will probably just close out the game, but I don't see us getting there. It is a minus eight. It says each opponent may discard a card. If they don't, they lose three life and then repeat this process six more times. Yeah, Professor Onyx is one of my favorite Planeswalkers coming out of Strixhaven. And uh, still put it in work today, but in this deck specifically, and I feel like she'll just mostly be utilized in the graveyard. And personally, as much as you're wanting that Planeswalker card type in the graveyard, you can get it with the other ones. All right, Dave, those are the Planeswalkers. Let's talk about these creatures. Yeah, so this deck had like a mild theme of insects. I don't like them. <laughs> so we're going to get rid of a couple. Carry on Grub is four mana for a creature insect. It's a zero five that says it gets plus X plus O where X is the greatest power among creatures in your graveyard. I don't care about that. It's a big dumb beater at best. It also says whenever it enters, you mill four cards. We have enough mill. We have enough ways to be able to just like throw cards into our graveyard. This is not going to do it for us. Next up is Moldgraf Millipede. It is four and a green for five mana. You get a creature insect horror. It's a 2-2 two -two and says whenever it enters, you mill three cards and then you need a plus one, plus one counter on this card for each creature card in your graveyard. Same thing as the last card that I talked about. It's a big dumb beater that mills one time and I really just don't care about that. Um, we have other creatures that I want to be able to reanimate. We have other big baddies that'll like actually close out the game instead of just like bumping up against our opponent's 1-1. One -one. Um, and we have much better mills. So the insects are uh, getting exterminated here. Exterminate. Next up, I'm going to be cutting a card that I actually do like. This is uh, Titania Nature's Force. It is four and two green for six mana. You get a legendary creature elemental. It is a six, six. It says you may play forest from your graveyard. Whenever a forest you control enters, you create a five, three green elemental creature token. And then whenever an elemental you control dies, you mill three cards. Um, I am cutting this card just because I felt like it's a little bit more on the expensive side. This is kind of starting to compete with like those reanimation targets. And just through playtesting with this list, I never felt like she was actually good enough. I would have preferred to just hit some of our other big re uh, reanimation targets instead. Also, I understand that, yes, she's cool. She can help us be able to get those lands into play. That does shut off our Delirium pretty quickly, though, if we're doing that consistently. And then although the 5-3 tokens are pretty nice, we do need a critical mass of them for us to be able to make any kind of like genuine impact. So um, this is a card that's... I do like it. I think it reads really well. It just, it wasn't playing the best for me. Yeah, I get that. You added things from like the 100, for example, like Doom Whisperer. That's a really good card in this deck. So just utilizes more. 
Two more creatures that are going to be getting the cut here, the first of which is Ursine Monstrosity. For three mana, you get a creature bear mutant. It's a 3-3 with Trample and says at the beginning of combat on your turn, you mill a card and you choose an opponent at random. This creature attacks that player in this combat if able, and until end of turn, Ursine Monstrosity gains Indestructible and gets plus one, plus one. For each creature card, type among cards in your graveyard. Um, this is a big, dumb beater. This one at least has Trample, so that's kind of cool, but I can't actually control where this thing goes. Uh, it points itself in its own direction, so I don't like my cards with free will. <laughs> Too random. And then the final creature they're going to be cutting, this one is Ishkana Graph Widow. It is four and a green for five mana. You get a three, five legendary creature spider with reach. This has delirium and it says whenever it enters, if there are four or more card types among cards in your graveyard, you create three, one, two green spider creature tokens with reach. And then of course you can pay seven mana if you ever want to and target opponent loses one life for each spider you control. That's got to be basically just like flavor text on this card. It's just too expensive. This is a cool card, but if you don't already happen to have Delirium, it's a 3-5 with Reach. Yeah, that is, um, that's not a good rate. If someone, I mean, just saying, if someone exiles your entire graveyard, you're really bummed because your deck kind of doesn't do the thing it wants to do. But if you had no cards in your graveyard, like you said, this is not good. Yeah, it has the potential to be really, really bad pretty easily. Always look at the floor on something. Cut it out if it's not good. Moving on to some non-permanent spells. We saw you added two. We are removing one. Um, Yeah, I'm going to be cutting one sorcery for this list. It's going to be Knight's Whisper. Um, don't hate me in the comments. I love this card. This was my last card that I had to cut. I, I was looking for something. This was it. This is one in a black for a sorcery. It says you draw two cards and you lose two life. Short, sweet ability. I love card draw. I actually do like this card, and I would have kept it in the list had I found something else. Uh, back to the permanents. We got two enchantments. Yeah, back to the permanents. I know. I'm trying to uh, mix this up and keep this as out of order as I possibly can. I do have two enchantments that are going to be cutting here. The first of which is Into the Pit, which is three mana for an enchantment. It says you may look at the top card of your library anytime, and then it also says you may cast spells from the top of your library by sacrificing a non-land permanent in addition to paying their other costs. Um, I like these kinds of cards. I like this style of effect. I like being able to get that card advantage. Playing around with this card, though, I always felt like it was a little clunky. This is a deck that really wants to be able to reanimate its big fatties, and you do hit a point kind of consistently, I felt like, where in order for me to be able to use this, I was sacrificing a creature that I didn't actually want to, or I was sacrificing like an engine that I didn't really want to. So I do like this card. I think that this most certainly has a home, um, but maybe in a deck that is able to use, I don't know, maybe something a little bit like go wide, just not this. And then the last card they're going to be removing from this list, bear with me when I apologize. This is the enchantment realm. So there's a lot of words. Whew, okay. So the first part of this card is polluted this turn it is one in a black for two mana you get an enchantment room and it says whenever one or more cards are put into your graveyard from your library each opponent loses one life card type among those cards so it's a cool little way to help you close out the game and i do actually like that the second part of this card is dim oubliette this is four and a black for a total of five mana once again enchantment room and it says whenever you unlock this door mill three cards and return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield this is a card that like i do actually enjoy what this doing everything that I want it to be able to do except for actually being able to like consistently put cards into the graveyard it does mill us but that's just one time the polluted cistern portion of this card I do actually like more than the dim loop yet but I did feel like this was one of those cards that like kind of put like an awkward a little bit of like amount of hate on us just through play testing um and it was I don't know I just I, I maybe I just don't know what to do with room and like when to unlock it <laughs> and when is actually supposed to like be a thing yeah, I think both of the enchantments that you cut out, including this one room, they make sense out of the deck. So <laughs> I'm glad you cut them personally. We saw you added some new lands for the mana base. Which lands are we removing to make room for those? So the first card that's going to get the cut here, this is Grim Backwoods. Uh, it's a land that can tap for a colorless, or we can pay four mana and tap it, as well as sacrifice a creature to draw a card. 
I do understand why this card is in the list. I think this is totally fine for the pre-con. Uh, it's just a little bit expensive for that kind of an effect. And ultimately, if we are doing that, we're probably in panic mode and we're not actually doing that to fill up our graveyard. Yeah, that definitely seems like a panic mode button. Jungle Hollow enters the battlefield tapped all of the time. We gain one life, which is basically flavor text. And then a whole turn later, we can tap this for a black or a green. I don't like tap. Necro Blossom Snarl, kind of the same logic on this one. This is a land that enters the battlefield tapped unless you reveal a swamp or a forest from your hand. Um, we can tap it later on for a black and a green. I always draw these cards after I've played the last basic in my hand. So like they are consistently just bad for me. Maybe somebody else out there has better luck, but that's just how I play with these cards. I don't like these. Neither do I. Viridescent Bog has a, uh, a bad habit of ending up in my opening hand. Always. This is a land that taps for uh, a green and a black if you pay one mana into it. So if you play this on turn one, you have no mana. No mana here. And then lastly, I'm going to get rid of Reliquary Tower. This is a land that says you have no maximum hand size. We can tap it for a colorless. Having no maximum hand size is such a powerful effect outside of this list, but this is a delirium deck. If I accidentally draw more than seven cards, I want to discard cards. I want to be able to fuel my graveyard. So having no maximum hand size is a downside, and this also doesn't tap for my colors. Yeah, you added another couple of lands that tapped for colors too. At some point, you get too many colorless lands and you got to remove some and you're probably not going to have a lot of stuff in your hands. You're going to be wanting to do the whole mill thing. So your card advantage comes from your graveyard. Yep. But yeah, that going to do it. Is that the entire upgrade to a death toll? That is going to do it. And that's going to take us right up to that budget. Okay. Spoiler alert. Let's, let's talk about that budget. Now we give you $300. What is the amount of money you spent? $299.63. So I don't know how much closer I get to this. Uh, you could have got a little closer with a couple more pennies, Dave. You never know. I'm just kidding. That's perfect. Good job. Thank but you. But before we wrap things up, Dave, do you have any final thoughts on winter as a commander and kind of how the deck is as a whole? Yeah, um, I think that this is... I, I think it's a cool deck. I do think that this is kind of a repeat of what we've seen a lot in the past, of uh, just like Golgari Reanimator. I do like that this one does have the ability to just grab permanence instead of just specifically creatures. So that does kind of open it up for at least like a little bit of a different avenue. Um, I think probably my biggest gripe with this deck is I still don't know how they use the hammer and like that plasma gun or electro plasma gun or whatever it is. Yeah, you never know. I guess we'll just uh, have to wait for that Netflix show. There you go. <laughs> it's going to happen this time. They can't cancel it twice, three right. times. How many times did they cancel? Uh, too many. But yeah, Dave, uh, I like the deck. I'm excited to play against it. Also terrified to play against it. Because you're going to be reanimating some scary stuff from that graveyard. Uh, but yeah, that's going to do it. If you guys like this video, hit that like button. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already so you're staying up to date with everything else that we got going on. Don't want to miss out on any other cool stuff. Comment down below. Do you agree with all these ads? Maybe there's something that David missed with an ad that you felt like they should have added. Comment down below. Always interested to hear guys' opinions. And in the description, you will find links to our social media accounts. That's TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram at Guys of Magic for each one. Follow us on those as well. If you guys wanted to check out the Mox field, the entire deck list, check the description for that link as well. On the screen right now, those are all of our Patreon subscribers. Thank you guys so much for your added support. You guys mean the world to us. If you guys wanted to check out what they're seeing, which is not here on YouTube, including the backup commander to this exact deck, Rendma, that is up on our Patreon right now. Go check it out. Link in the description. And until the next video, hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Peace. Later.